Yeah, what we think, that's a good point. So one of the things that this structure has is these, uh, the materials that should be transforming, they should be, they, they're, um, they're, so th these are, are um, Q4. Uh, the, uh, the, the, and then you have the ones which are projected outward, that they're, they're connected in sort of this direction. So it, the Q th we expect that the Q3s would, of course, be polymerizing. Right, so so that as so, I, I suppose that it's these guys here that should be in the process of being most affected. Yeah, they should be the ones that which are affected. And so, and in fact, uh, let's see. Maybe let's go to the. Uh, let's see. Let's see. This goes. This is the next. The one that's so that one was at nine days. This is ten point five. And what you and so what we see is you know you don't see too many from within these, but you see these. Let's see. May, maybe helmet. Maybe this might be an example. So you have this. So there's a, there's, that's an indication. I hadn't thought of exactly that. But these are starting to form, looks like some of these transition sort of perhaps partial, which then maybe because of the cross-link, they go from a two Q3s to one now, or two Q4s then. So, so I think that uh, getting and stopping the, the synthesis at just the right moment is, is, kinda, is, is the point of being involved in the synthesis. Because if we hadn't been involved in the synthesis, and then we would have, you know, the, this Korean group had made the final product. And then we had only asked them and worked with them, and they did this in Santa Barbara, to synthesize these in stages so that we could interrupt them, so we could follow the transformation, essentially, ex situ. So we're not following it in situ, because these have to be quenched. But the, we stop, quench it, dry it, and then can follow it. But it seems also you have correlation between um, Q1 uh, to the 3 and the Q4 sides of the product. No? Yeah. Or could maybe try to get more resolution in this if you do this with very short contact times? Ah, uh, yeah, maybe, or do a T1 filter, because then, the nice thing about that is that, uh, to follow Helmut's suggestion, is that the, these, um, these Q3 species would have shorter relaxation times. And so in some ways, we could, do a sh we could focus only on those. And maybe, actually, that's a good point, because this, this big crystalline blob, these are all overlapping silicon sites of 24. We could down, they have very long relaxation times, relatively speaking. So we could probably do that. That's an that's a excellent idea, actually. Yeah. What if you prepare the mixture between the organic and the inorganic? You, uh, you, you can see some, some formation of bonded and covalent bonds between the organic so in this case, I, I think in all of these cases, we don't see any covalent bonds. These are only, so what's interacting here, and that's interesting, so the way we could see that is if we had a J-coupling, right? That's what, because you have that in proteins, you have J-couplings. The J-couplings are, of course, through bond. The, these are all, these surfactants are all electrostatic. It's only because, uh, I don't have that here, they're electrostatic in, in the sense that they have, uh, these, uh, well, here, the quaternary ammonium, right? So these are charged. So it's electrostatic charges on this that cause it to be interacting with different silicate sites. So it's only electrostatic, so no covalent bond. The, and the saccharides, it's only hydrogen bonding. So, so the, if there was, you know, one could, you know, we can make an ormacil organically modified silicate and do something similar, but in this case, we have no only physical interactions. And, now, if there's any organic chemists, or you have organic chemistry friends, it helps to have, you know, it's nice to know a doctor, someone with a sailboat, and there's something, and someone who can synthesize molecules like this. Because 
it's, this is something that is, is you know, in some ways, a beautiful hypothesis. So what they did, if you remember, and I'll just say this in a, in a moment, is that they, they, they showed this with, um, it, back to this part, they had, um, they, they, you know, back the, this guy. So it was non, tetra, tetrapropyl ammonium is, this ZSIM5 is synthesized in tons, huge amounts. This is a C6 linkage. This is two, in other words, two C3 linkages. So basically, if they use a C4 linkage, linkage or C3 or C5, it doesn't work. It works because these are spaced exactly as they would be in a normal synthesis if it was just individual structure directing molecules. So as far as the, Z, the, strict, the structure directing, it's, it looks the same for this. It's just that they're linked by this complicated surfactant such that it doesn't crystallize into a, f a single particle, it's connected to the surfactant such that it keeps the crystallizing framework separate from other ones. So choosing the organic structure directing to be two times three is exactly, the, is the only version of this that templates ZSM5. So it's very interesting from the small molecule point of view. And, and the interactions, you know, so it, there could be many other things one can do now, I think, to control Crystallization with self-assembly, thinking, thinking like this. So you now take the understanding that the, say, crystallization community has developed, and now combine it with the structure directing of the surfactant community. I think there's a lot of design possibilities for new, new materials here. And not necessarily only on silicates and luminates. Let's say titania. I mean, one of those things, I've, I've actually, that's something we should think maybe talk about, Kawe, because I don't know if there's possibilities to choose conditions of the isoelectric point where one can now choose a structure directing agent which would interact strongly with a sort of like anatase or rutile, crystallize, but do it in a way where you can now not oxidize or destroy the surfactant group so that you could get mesostructured titania. That's a possibility. I don't see why not. I mean, it's a matter of, the, of, of balancing the chemistry. We can't do, we talked about it yesterday, you can't do titanium NM, NMR like this. But knowing this, you can maybe adjust the right synthesis conditions to do something similar and not worry about the NMR because you have the insight from the silicon. The, 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 the sophisticated uh, aspects, uh, which I agree with me, uh, on the, the case of aluminum uh, atoms by iron atoms, which is quite possible in terms of natural materials, is it, uh, is it a strong influence? And another question is regarding the uh, oxygen vacancies. It will have, a, uh, it will have a different uh, thermal treatments in, in the case of in your other lives. You can have the appearance of different oxygen vacancies. How can this uh, alter the MR? You talk about cement with the zeolites. Oh, I think the problem can be okay, well, well, right. both, but it's in, in, in some parts that would be formed. Cement, there's a lot of, and so we used a lot of these methods on white Portland cement because they have little iron. And the iron is, a, is, a, is used in, for reasons I'm not sure about, in gray oil well cements, uh, maybe probably because it's cheaper. Um, but it, it's, it uh, tends to be substituted in the place of this aluminoferrites, right? So it's always accompanied by these three coordinate kind of illuminates. Um, oxygen vacancies, I think, are, this is, these are so disordered. I mean, there, there's not, I don't, I don't know that there's, I don't know that there's such a thing as a crystalline vacancy in these materials. But, but the, uh, the iron actually contributes, you know, broadening because it's paramagnetic. So I'm not sure, maybe we can, I, that's, a, that's a, maybe an expansive question. I don't have a, I don't know what, what specifically you're asking, but iron is a problem in the sense that it, it, it's paramagnetic and it affects, uh, makes it difficult to measure these NMR signals because it broadens them. Okay, so iron in this, in any, or any of them, is usually troublesome. Uh, and so we tend to work with systems, when we understand the chemistry, with l lower iron contents, just to make it, the signals better resolved and the, and the, and the interpretation more, uh, more clear. When you're in the oxygen vacuums, you can have the lights in longer, longer times. Does it go stay in your structures? Well, I mean, if you I think about it, on the surface of all these particles, you have hydroxyl groups, right? I guess, th is that an oxygen vacancy? I don't know, but you have, the whole surface is a huge defect. In the case of these layered silicates, you also have silanols on all of them, because they're all 
OH groups is which are on the surfaces. And those are the ones that would eventually cross-link in the case of the zeolite to form these structures. Uh, when you, when you run the, the See several uh, correlations. Uh, you you uh, force the, the compact time to see. Is this the inclusion that signals are? These are not long contact. These are like I think four, uh, four. This was four microseconds. So, okay. So so for example, what uh, what Tiago was saying is that uh, so this, this, the contact time at the bottom is four mi milliseconds. That time is only to optimized in order to do. It's the time that you allow this coupling to occur. And, and this is one of the things that Helmut was also suggesting. The shorter the time, the, the stronger the couplings that engage. So if we used, so four milliseconds is relatively long. And, and so we see, in this case, a long contact time. And therefore, we see couplings amongst them all. So what, one of the things Helmut was suggesting is that you can use a contact time, which is short, and thereby get only the strongest couplings and, and just exclude the weak ones. Now, it turns out that we, in these layered silicates, they're all very close to the, to the surfactants. So it's not a strong difference. But you do see the, these Q3 and Q4 species, which actually now are, are prevalent. They have stronger couplings because so they have silanol they have protons. They, and so they're closer to the hydroxyl groups. So they have stronger couplings compared to the Q4 species. So you can use this as a parameter to filter which couplings are engaged. And the longer they are, to have first approximation, the more complete from strong to weak that you see. This time, four milliseconds is relatively long. So, for, so four milliseconds is relatively long. You can get down to something like half a millisecond, 500 microseconds, which is not hard to get much shorter. And then you can see more short couplings. What we wanted to see here is basically that we had everything that was, you know, we, we wouldn't actually, in this case, we would not see a big difference. But this gave the maximum signal intensity. Well, so this, this, um, this, I think, took uh, approximately 12 hours, maybe 18, not so long. I mean, the one thing I will say is about for the J couple of experiments, well, and maybe this is for, for just those, uh, Helmut and, and Tiago, is that this particular experiment with uh, Darren Brower and Malcolm Levitt, uh, this day is a dipole coupling, and they, they can do this on actual abundant samples. But it's not through bond. The J couplings turn out to be more informative because they're directly through bond, and those require isotopic enrichment. But you know, in the end, and for us, and this may be a, as, a, as a factor, the most costly aspect of these measurements is the NMR time. Okay, our central facility we pay per hour, and if we use a, 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 2D, a 2D J couple experiment, we'll take a day each, maybe more. So that's about for us about 300 to 400 dollars per day of to acquire a spectrum like this. If we acquire two 2D spectra, it's cheaper to isotopically label. And we can do jade coupling. So we are, we routinely isotopically enrich in silicon because it's not the most costly part of our experiment. The most costly part of the experiment is our payment to the laboratory to use the instrument. But that's okay because we get beautiful data like this, which gets us more grants, and so it's self-perpetuating. So that's the way our <laughs> university business model works. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> uh, this one, uh, I think I had one up there was 20 kilohertz for magic angle spinning. Uh, most of the time, silicon, it's not so necessary. So, uh, but we do have the UCSB, another, uh, we have a, a 50 and a 70 kilohertz probe head. So that's good for protons and for fluorine, for, pro for solids anyway. So. By the way, we, as far as we're concerned, so the 800 we have is nice uh, for resolution. But in fact, with a fast spinning and 500 megahertz, you get essentially equivalent resolution. And it's a lot less expensive. So we actually do most of our experiments on the 500 megahertz just for, with a fast spinning probe head, which is maybe a better investment than a $2 million 800. I mean, that's uh, something that, so getting, a, so, so getting a 500 megahertz with a fast spinning probe head is a very, I think, uh, good investment because that will be maximally useful for many people, especially those with polymers and biological solids.